The other day, I was at an alumni event, and I ran into an old friend I hadn't seen for a long time. I was so excited to see her, and she ran over to me and gave me a big hug and said, how are you? And before I could answer her, she answered for me. She said, I know how you are. You're really busy, crazy busy. I can't even imagine life with four kids and a book launch and everything you have going on. You must be so busy. Now, a couple of years ago, I would have met a greeting like that with all the gory details of just exactly how busy I am. Crazy busy. But this year, I didn't do that because I have learned that busyness is a sign that I am not fulfilling my potential and that we human beings achieve more by doing less. When we dial back, thank you, when we dial back those feelings of busyness and overwhelm, we allow our most creative, most intelligent, most joyful, and most productive selves to emerge. But we really can't dial back all the busyness and all the overwhelm until we confront three big myths, lies that our cultures are teaching us that we most of us have really bought into in one way or another. So the first myth is really that busyness is a sign of importance, that busyness is a sign that we are significant and successful and productive. We wear it like a badge of honor. We see the ability to withstand stress as a mark of character. But of course, this isn't true. We all know plenty of incredibly significant people who are doing really important work in the world, many of whom are right here in this room or at this conference, who are not busy. They are not multitasking. They are not overwhelmed. And by the same token, we all know people who are busy and overwhelmed and running from meeting to meeting, but aren't particularly productive or successful. So what do we do? to keep this idea, this myth, that busyness is a sign of importance from holding us back. I like to think of of what we're doing here as a little bit like the work that we did yesterday with Byron Katie. We've identified a belief that is causing suffering, and we can turn it around. We can move from the idea that multitasking and busyness is a sign of our productivity or or a route to being highly productive to the truth, which is that we are actually more productive when we single task. So that, that last slide, when we are busy, 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 it really looks much more like what researchers call cognitive overload, right? So we think multitasking is a sign of of importance and productivity. But cognitive overload is one of those things that hinders our productivity and hinders the power of our mind. It makes it more difficult for us to think clearly and to plan. And it makes it hard for us to control our emotions. It makes it really hard for us to make decisions. It hinders our ability to resist temptations. And it makes it especially hard for us to remember important social information, like the name of our daughter's boss or our boss's daughter. So we can turn, turn this around by thinking about the fact that we are more productive when we single task. I was very happy yesterday to hear Professor Turkle say that single tasking or unitasking is the next big thing. That's fantastic news for the rest of us because it's actually true that, that single tasking will make us more productive. Our brains are not computers. They were not designed to run multiple apps at any one given time. We've heard a lot about this at this conference. When we are multitasking, asking our brain to do a lot of different things at once, it is simply just switching back and forth between all of those things again and again. And that multitasking causes our productivity to drop. This this takes time. We lose efficiency and our error rates go way up. So I've given you something simple you can do instead to help you be more successful, right? Isn't this simple? 
to just simply sin single task, I actually personally find it incredibly difficult to do. In today's world, I have to basically chain myself to my computer, work at a computer that doesn't have email access, put my phone in a completely different room, turn all the alerts off. I'm a little bit like a toddler going on a road trip in that I have to go potty, get myself a drink of water, have a little snack. But once I get myself there, I've cued to my brain that I'm just going to allow myself to focus. And that allows me to do my highest quality work with greatest ease. And more than that, time seems to slip away, right? We lose our sense of time. And that feeling is the very opposite of feeling busy. Myth number two, more is better. We live in a more is more kind of a culture where we're always looking for a more prestigious job or more likes on Facebook or more enrichment activities for our kids. We certainly take on more work in order to earn more money so that we can buy more stuff. But the truth is, of course, that often less is so much more. And when we step back from this lie that more is going to be better, a lot of the time what we find is that we already have enough. So this concept that less is sometimes more is really well encapsulated by this concept or this idea of the minimum effective dose. Doctors look for the minimum effective dose. They prescribe their patients the minimum amount of medication that will still be effective. And I found that we can apply this concept to every area of our lives. How little time can we spend on our email and still be effective at work? How little time can we spend on social media and still feel connected to one another? The really surprising place that I found was uh, more effective to be doing less was exercise, ironically. I had been trying for years to incorporate some strength training into my exercise routine and spent a lot of money on gyms and personal trainers trying to come up with the perfect strength training program, which I really never did. I was always traveling or sore or something, right? There was always a reason not to do this until I designed the, what I call the better than nothing workout which is, I, uh, I wake up, wait till you hear this, I, it's very unambitious. I wake up, I do my meditation, I'm still in my pajamas, and I do 20 push-ups and 25 squats and a one minute plank. It takes me three minutes. That is my entire workout. <laughs> but here's the thing, I can do it every day. I do it five or sometimes six days a week, and even though it is pathetically unambitious, I am stronger now than I was when I, 20 years ago when I was running marathons. So sometimes less is more. Thank you. I really challenge you all to do this for every activity in your life, from email or meetings to the time you spend helping your children with their homework. Everything can be examined in this way. What would be the most effective. More is probably not always better. Okay, myth number three I think is the most pernicious of all, and that is the myth that doing nothing is a waste of time. We don't like to stand in line waiting for things or just stare out the window while we're driving or just sit and do nothing. Timothy Wilson's presentation this morning made that abundantly clear. We would rather shock ourselves than just sit and stare into space, let ourselves daydream. That's wasting time and time is money. And if there is anything we hate to waste more than time, it's money in our culture. But the truth is that our brains, of course, really benefit when we quote unquote waste time. When we let ourselves daydream or our minds wander, an area of our brain comes online that is responsible for creative insight. And our best work comes from those creative insights. Ask anybody who's come up with a really 
innovative solution to a problem, and what will they say? Where will they say they came up with that idea? In the shower, right? I was very happy to hear Pico Ayer yesterday talk about how he does all of his best work while on walks, just staring into space. So the turnaround here is that doing nothing is a very productive use of our time. Staring into space is really will benefit us. Now, this is another thing, right? This is what I, could I have possibly given you an easier activity to do? Lower energy? Is this an easy thing for us to do? It kind of seems like it should be, but if we have been paying attention here at this conference, what we've learned is that it's very, very difficult for us to just be alone with our thoughts, letting ourselves daydream. What do we do when we have a little bit of time? We reach for our devices. We, want, we, we are able to check our email at any given time, right? We do this immediately. And we do it because when we're not being productive, when we're not doing something, we feel the opposite of the way we think we should feel when we're busy. We feel insignificant and unimportant and unproductive and unsuccessful. And all those feelings of anxiety and maybe guilt that we're not doing, doing, doing something are very well numbed by checking our devices or getting, getting ourselves busy in some way. Now, the problem with this is that that numbing behavior doesn't numb selectively our emotions, right? We can't numb out the anxiety that we feel when we're not working and not numb the profound joy that might come or the great gratitude. Or as Louis C.K. says, <laughs> you never feel completely sad or completely happy. Right. You just feel kind of satisfied with your product. Yes. <laughs> and then you die. <laughs> so, so my best advice is to give yourself that time daydreaming, but to pay attention to how you feel. Right? Let yourself feel how you feel. If anxiety comes up that you're not working, notice that with curiosity and acceptance. So now that we've rejected these three big cultural lies, where does that leave us? Where it leaves us is perfectly positioned to live and work from our sweet spot. So many of us believe that we will only get where we are going by making a powerful effort. The sweet spot, though, is about finding that place in us of effortless power. It's that wonderful overlap between where we have the greatest ease in our lives and where we have our greatest strengths. This is where we hit all of our home runs. And the wonderful thing is that we all have a sweet spot, of course. We just need to get out of our own way in order to find it. More than a decade of really wonderful brain science has shown us that the road to success and to happiness and to productivity is not paved by overwork. We will not get there by leaning into our careers, if that means leaning away from the things that bring our greatest ease or greatest joy. We will not get there by always making a more powerful effort. In the same way that a relaxed muscle has more strength than a tense one, we humans achieve more when we do less. Socrates once said, beware the banality of the busy life. And to that I would add, behold the astonishing richness that comes when we live life from our sweet spot. Thank you. <laughs>